I would like to introduce to everyone our guest, Ed Carr, who is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of South Carolina. He was a triple AS fellow serving as the climate change coordinator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at USAID. He's now serving his second year of his AAAS fellowship as a climate change science advisor on the climate change team in the Bureau for Economic Growth, Agriculture, and Trade at USAID. For more than 14 years, he has worked in rural sub-Saharan Africa on issues of globalization, development, and environmental change, living among and working with the poorest of the poor. He is the author of more than 30 publications on issues of development, adaptation to climate change, and the changing global environment. And he has served as a lead author of two global environmental assessments. And he's been awarded a Science and Technology Policy Fellowship from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, and a Mellon Fellowship in the Humanities from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. His research has also been supported by the National Science Foundation, the National Geographic Society, the University of South Carolina, the University of Kentucky, and Syracuse University, and he's probably tired of hearing his story over wherever he goes. So um, without further ado, I want to welcome Ed to talk about his book, Delivering Development, Small Farmers, Big Assumptions, and Hope for a Just Sustainable World. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here. Thank you all for showing up to listen to me go on at length. Um, <laughs> hopefully not too much at length. Um, right, so I guess I fall as an academic and to whatever extent I am a practitioner, I guess I fall into the category of someone who's something of a development critic. But I fall into a weird space as a development critic because where that whole camp, at least academically, has become quite polarized between sort of the Jeff Sachs side of criticism, which is we just lack political will, we need to spend more money on this, it'll be fine. And the Bill Easterly side of the world, which is the it's all governance and spending more money will get us nowhere kind of criticism, I actually think they're both sort of wrong. And I'm backing up another layer, arguing that they're actually both operating from some shared assumptions that actually are demonstrably incorrect. So their whole argument might not make much sense right now. Uh, but how did I get to a place where I'm actually criticizing both Sachs and yeah. Easterly, right? Uh, how, how did I get here? Well, that requires kind of explaining something of a story of how I came to be a development person in the first place, right? In the year 2000, I was a PhD candidate. And as Dr. Hauser over here can tell you, since he was my roommate back in Syracuse back in the day, uh, I was actually pretty much focused on archaeology, not on development stuff. This is an excavated area in one of the places I was working in, Domenazzi. I'll be talking quite a bit about Domenazzi uh, today as we go on. But before I wade too much into that, let's talk about where we are in the world, just to kind of get everybody located. Uh, we are in Ghana, in West Africa. So there's Africa up top center there. That little darkened in area is Ghana. But if you look over to Ghana, which is just the upper right-hand corner, down at the bottom there, in the sort of the center, there's a little arrow with words. That's where the study area is, that blown up area that you see on the map. I'll be talking about Palm Krum and Dominanzi, two villages uh, right at the center of that map today. Just to ground things for you, right? Because, you know, otherwise we'll just talk about maps in the abstract. This is Palm Krum. Uh, take, it's a picture taken in 2006 from the southwest of the village. Uh, I was actually back there about two months ago. It looks pretty much exactly like this. It has not changed at all in the last five years. Uh, it's a village of about 220 people, 110 adults, about an equal number of children or thereabouts. There's basically no infrastructure here. There's no electricity, there's no running water. There is one borehole that's been drilled by a French NGO in 1997 down to groundwater. So they have a very clean supply of water. Unfortunately, that borehole seems to be salinizing now. After 15 years, that's not probably too surprising. And when I arrived here, first working here in 1997, there wasn't even a road there were two footpaths that were not really motorable. Okay, so this gives you a little bit of sense of what we're dealing with. Oh, and you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner of the picture, there's a little blur there. That's a toucan. Remember the toucan. We're going to be coming back to the toucan later. <clears throat> this is Dominanzi, taken from the east, uh, kind of from a hill sort of above, also taken in 2006. That used to be an enormously inconvenient tree in the middle of this picture. Um, but that was taken in 06, and since then, the two structures that were behind the tree have been abandoned and fallen down. So it's actually an ever more appropriate picture, so that tree has become very convenient for me. Today, the village has about 10 people in it. Infrastructurally, it's basically the same as Pong Krum, minus the borehole. 
all right? They don't have that. They have an open well. Uh, you can drink from it. I don't advise drinking from it if you like normal intestinal function, but you can drink from it there. That's all they basically have. All right? Now, the two villages together, just to give you some characteristics, this is a satellite image of the area that Del Nazi at the bottom from Kroom at the top. They're about 500 meters apart. The two villages here we're talking about, we're dealing with folks the average household income running at about $2 per day per capita. Uh, there are several households that make a little bit more than that, and some households that are well below the dollar a day threshold, although typically those are female-headed households, and they're not really economically viable as independent entities. That's a whole separate conversation, but an important one. The vast bulk of livelihoods in this area comes from agriculture. About 65% of the average household income is coming out of agricultural production, the other 35 from fairly irregular non-farm employment. Uh, so generally speaking, we're not talking about highly diversified livelihoods, we're not talking about a lot of money. The people in these villages, as you saw in those pictures, they live in structures that are made of earth, roofed with bamboo, tin sheets, aluminum sheets now sometimes, asbestos sheets. We're not talking about a lot of infrastructure here. When I showed up as a 24-year-old grad student back in 1997, this is what I thought poverty was. This is what I thought poor meant, okay? I had no sense of what I was dealing with, like most people coming to this part of the world for the first time. And like most people who show up in a place like this, what I sort of unconsciously constructed for myself was this narrative of lack. Something hadn't happened here yet. Something had not yet arrived. Something needed to come in and change things. This was not something I consciously spent a lot of time thinking about, but it was something that was sort of going on for me. And while living in and around these villages for about 20 months since 1997 really has called into question my understanding of things like poverty. I actually think it's a worthless term. It is not analytical and does not help us guide anything that we do in the world. Uh, at the time, when I was first here, that was something that was sort of echoing in the back of my head, not something that I had worked through. And so then we get back to where I started this talk in 2000, where I was working on that archaeological dig, and specifically June of 2000, when we hit two burials in the course of the archaeological dig. Now, for most archaeologists, this is nothing unusual. You hit burials as you do your work, but that was really unusual for me. Because, see, I wasn't digging for much of the deep history of this area. I was digging for 1960. Because these villages had changed dra dramatically since then. We didn't have much understanding of the livelihoods that existed in the 60s. Life expectancies in Ghana are about 59 years. So anyone making livelihoods decisions in 1960 had long since passed away. Um, so we were actually looking at the spatial organization of the household in 1960 to help us understand what was going on then we could compare it to today's spatial organizations and livelihoods. Um, and we stumbled onto burials that were only about 30 to 40 centimeters deep. They weren't supposed to be there. The Fonti tend to bury their dead about two meters deep or when they hit bedrock. This was neither two meters nor bedrock. Now, in looking at this burial, what we found is that we're dealing with a man, young man, 19 to 20 years old, we have no idea what he passed away from. As you can see, the remains were kind of limited. This is wet, acidic clay. So the fact there were any bone, bones left at all is quite remarkable. Uh, he dates the burial dates from the goods that were in the, in the burial to about 1820, 1825, making this the earliest evidence we actually have for the existence of these villages. This is probably one of the very first people who lived here. And while I can't tell you who he was, and I can't tell you what he died from, I can tell you what he was buried with. And what he was buried with is British sheet brass hammered into an Akan vessel called the Porwa, a Dutch smoking pipe in beads from Venice and Bohemia. In 1820, in a relatively insignificant village in a backwater of the world economy, the global economy is already here. Not only is it already here, it's been here long enough and been buried in these people's lives long enough that it actually can serve as grave goods, which is obviously a highly symbolic thing in anyone's culture. You don't just do this overnight. This was, as you might imagine, a little destructive for my narrative of lack, <laughs> right? Because the world economy is parked in this grave. And when an event like this happens and kind of jars you, you pick up your head and you start to look around at a bunch of other stuff you'd seen dozens of times, and you start seeing it really differently. For example, you start looking around at things like transportation networks. And you see that dotted road that runs from Pumkrum and Dominaz diagonally down to the right toward Elmina. Well, as I told you back in 1997, even in 2000, it was still an unmotorable footpath. 
But as French historian, archaeologist, and colleague of Dr. Hauser and I, uh, Gerard Schwen has, I think, convincingly demonstrated this is very likely the remains of Ashanti Road number seven, which linked Elmina as a major <coughs> slave out port as well as a trade port with the inland Ashanti kingdom. Now, 1820, 1825, the slave trade is still going. This trade is still going. This would have been a very major route north-south through what today is gone at the time would have been the Gold Coast. In other words, these folks set up their settlements along this main trade route. That's probably why these villages are where they are. It's because this trade existed. On top of that, the story of the road doesn't end there. Because in the late 1940s, this, what then was, would have still been a footpath, was actually improved into a road by a local man named George Annan, who was trying to open up access to a logging concession he had to the north of Barassi, sort of northernmost village you see on that map. When he did so, he opened up two things. One, limited local non-farm employment, mostly maintain the road, it was low-grade work. But more importantly, we opened up a bunch of transportation that started moving up and down this road. Suddenly, it got very easy to get in and out of these villages, giving the people living in these villages access to sort of regional, at least local and regional, uh, non-farm employment opportunities. It sort of transformed people's livelihoods. They were able to do more than farm. Their income shot up. And we can see this in the changing landscape of the area, which I'll get to in a second. But even as you look at the transportation network, you see different things. Just walking around and looking at people's fields, you start looking around and seeing different things. This is a fairly typical view of the landscape around Pongkrum and Domenazi. This happens to be to the northeast of the villages, but it, you could be almost anywhere. What you're looking at are farm plots for probably something like five different farmers. Um, and as you can see, they're pretty heavily intercropped here. The typical farmer in this area raises, on average, about eight crops a year. What's interesting in the context of, again, sort of looking up and seeing the world differently, is that in a given year, roughly 80% of the crops you find on the farms of Pongkrum and Dominanzi are not African domesticates. They are not from here. They came during the Colombian exchange. They came during colonialism. They came during agricultural extension after independence and in what we call development now. Over 180, 190 odd years, the residents of Domenazi and Pongkrum have more or less completely reworked their agroecology. And think of the challenges and fears we have today about changing ecologies, invasive species, new pests, all sorts of damage you can do to various biogeochemical cycles. These folks managed to incorporate these crops time and again with limited scientific training, with limited outreach, with limited resources. And they did so in a manner that did not crash their local ecology, and that actually resulted in sustainable livelihoods that have lasted nearly two centuries. It's a remarkable story when you look at it that way. This is not some pre-modern landscape, and these are not a bunch of backward people. This is a fully modern landscape, and these people are enormously talented. So, what you start to realize when you start looking around after, again, a burial moment or something along those lines, is that, in fact, these places are not lacking development. They are not lacking engaged with the global economy. They are fully engaged with this, and to some extent, they're actually, at least initially, development and globalization success stories. You can see this in a couple of different ways. <clears throat> this is a plan of, on the top, Pongkrum, and on the bottom, Domenazi which I constructed by going around with some of my uh, field crew. And we looked at standing and fallen structures and using ethno-historical information from the few people who can remember that far back, sort of reconstructed these landscapes as they changed over time. And what you can see, 50, 60, 70, these landscapes and the villages are growing. People don't move to places that don't work out very well. So quite clearly, there's something drawing people here and on the same time, keeping people here if they're born here. On top of this, archaeologically, one of the things we see from the 60s, the material culture is actually richer. That is to say, it represents greater wealth than what we see in the villages today. For example, there's just a ton of evidence for glass bottles in the 60s. People in these villages really can't afford stuff that comes in glass bottles today. So quite clearly, incomes were higher. People had different kinds of access and opportunity, 50, 60, 70. This then led to sort of my first personal revelation, my first questioning of a lot of the assumptions that we have about how development and globalization work. The places that we characterize as needing development, being outside of the global economy, often much better understood as the outcomes of development and globalization. This is a very 
very important thing to be thinking about because most of development and most thinking on globalization is terribly ahistorical. It doesn't spend any time looking at how people got into the situation they're in. It starts from you are here, you have a problem, how do we solve it? But the problem is, if you start from there and you don't understand how people got here in the first place, you run the risk of prescribing the very thing that got them into trouble in the first place. And I think you see that happening a lot more often than anyone wants to admit. Well, up to this point, I've kind of characterized these villages as a development success story, right? But we know it doesn't really work out that way because you saw that growing landscape and now Domenanzi basically doesn't exist and Palm Prim's a little bigger than it was. And I told you their incomes are down, the material culture is down today. Something went horrendously wrong. Well, what went wrong is that the global economy giveth and the global economy taketh away. Just as sort of the global market for tropical hardwoods is in fact what motivated the the 1940s improvement of this road into the area. In the late 1960s, the global market for tropical hardwoods turned, went very, very bad. In Ghana, it completely collapsed. At the same time, realized that this concession had been running for more than 20 years. To this day, I have no idea how they logged for 20 years on this concession. Uh, I don't have any early satellite or aerial imagery to demonstrate how large this thing must have been when they started cutting it. In any case, it had been 20 years, on and wanted out of this operation anyway. He was an old man at that point, and so he did. He shut it down. And here's the problem kicks in, because you see, he still owned the road. Despite the efforts of the villagers, and we have written records of this, despite Anand's efforts, they could not get the colonial government, which was British in the 50s, to buy the road up and take it over themselves. So it remained a private road, which meant that as soon as the logging concession went off, and Anand disappears, so does the road. See, this was, again, a graded dirt road. And anyone who's been in this part of the world and has dealt with sort of monsoon rainfall can tell you a graded dirt road has one to two seasons of motorability. If you don't maintain it, then it's off. But even more important, the whole reason that a lot of traffic had been going up and down the road was the logging concession at the other end of it, and that was gone. So transportation largely disappears here, which means that people lose easy access to that regional labor market if they're going to keep maintaining their farms, which most of them want to do. This results in the loss of diversification in people's livelihoods. They basically are pushed back onto their farms, which wouldn't be a total disaster except for climate change. Um, because you see, in West Africa along the coasts, there's been a long-term decline in average precipitation. As you can see, there's enormous variability bouncing around. This is, by the way, from Dunkwa, which is an incredible 40 kilometers away, but is the nearest continuously monitored rain gauge in Ghana for these areas. It's one of the big problems we have in climate change research is we just don't have good coverage in rain gauges historically. But what you can see is the trend line is down. And sometime in the 70s, well, actually late 60s, early 70s, that trend line crossed below the threshold at which you can grow cocoa reliably. Cocoa is a major cash crop. These folks have been growing cocoa. Not anymore. At the same time, this is the first time we hear the farmers start talking about the fact that their farm yields were dropping and were becoming problematic. So just as they lose diversification in their livelihoods and are thrust back onto their farms, their farms are no, now no longer producing stuff quite as well as it used to. In other words, sort of the second major lesson kicks in here which is that what I, at what I call globalization shoreline, the edge of global markets, of global politics, of global connection, where these connections come and go and come and go, something like tides or waves, but not terribly regularly and in very strange and turbulent and uneven ways. The experience of what we call development can often be extremely negative. The reason is because the way we practice development today, the way we often see globalization play out in practice, they serve as what I tend to think of as a giant risk engine. They generate risk in new ways and push that risk down the human food chain, as it were, to the poorest people, the ones least able to manage that risk. And so what you see here is a kick in of the risk engine, right? which is the global markets work for you, but they can turn against you really quickly. And this is risk these folks didn't understand. They had nothing to do with creating, and they had no means of managing, at least dealing with the root cause. They could deal with its manifestations, but not its root cause. So then what happens here when the risk engine kicked in? What happened was a tremendously complex abandonment of the area. Starting almost immediately in 1970, we see people pouring out of both of these villages, actually. 
The people who left immediately tended to be in households headed by younger men who had already been working a great deal off their farms. These folks moved to places where they could get access to land, but they could still have access to those job opportunities. Basically, they were not going to, to live through, put up with the loss of connection to these other opportunities, the larger kind of global economy, as it were. But you'll notice, especially in Dominazzi, it's really evident. It's harder to see in Pong Krum because there's a lot of noise there. You'll notice that abandonment of Dominazzi takes a while. It takes almost two decades. Now, this is not because a significant chunk of the population, roughly 30%, was just not bright enough to see what had happened to them. They all had. They all understood what was going on. Some folks, younger men again, started to look for opportunities. It took them a while to get them. They trickled out. But really what you see, especially between 80 and 90, is the departure of a bunch of female-headed households. They're all leaving right after the death of the male head of household. And what's happening is two things. First of all, it's an indicator of a con land tenure practice and property rights at the time, which is more or less their matrilineal, which means that the husband's property belongs to the husband's family, so when he dies, the wife gets nothing, neither do the kids. They've all got to go. So they have to leave. But more importantly, what this also indicates is we're dealing with a bunch of men who chose to stay and they were much older men. They chose to stay because as older men they couldn't compete on local labor markets, so there was not really any major point to moving. But also what's going on here is that they have a different potential source of authority and legitimacy. These are the men who control access to land in these villages. So by staying put and controlling access to land for the few remaining people in this area, they can still be important, they still have social status. They made a decision to de-link, to de-globalize, to go local with their source of authority, to go local with what they saw as satisfaction in a lot of different ways, even though that meant they were compromising the incomes of their households and to some extent the material standard of living for their households. People can globalize, but they can also de-globalize. Um, just really quickly, what you're seeing, that regrowth of Pong Krum at the top, not at all driven by people moving from Dominazzi to Pong Krum. Only two households did that. What happens is, in the early and mid-1980s, under structural adjustment, things get very, very bad in many Ghanaian cities. And what we see are a couple of households moving out of cities, retreating from the cities, who could get access to land here. They effectively became a beachhead for the rest of their families, which then started to follow them in. So what you're dealing with today is an almost entirely different population in these villages than who was here in the 60s and 70s. And the livelihoods reflect that. They're very different. They're actually designed to deglobalize. They grow crops that they can either sell or eat at any given time. The point of this, then, is my third major issue. Globalization is not one way. We tend to talk about globalization, I think in the popular media as well, as some sort of triumphal process, right? Once it happens, once you're dialed in, there's no going back. For some people, maybe that's true, but not for everybody. And there are a whole set of people for which we have evidence, living out again on what I think of as this sort of shoreline, where people pick their way in and pick their way out year to year, depending on what's to their best advantage, how they might best manage changes going on, how they might best manage risk. This is not, again, something that we talk very intelligently about, but I think we need to start thinking very carefully about, because actually, it just it doesn't work the way people say. Now, this is a complicated story. And it's one that I'm telling really simply, and it's still complicated. I burned about 50,000 words on the front end of this story, right? So distilling this a lot. But yes, it is complex. And this gets to my last major point, right? Which is that we deal in enormously complex systems when we think about development. We don't tend to treat them that way, but that is what we're dealing with. They're comp complex agroecological systems, for example. This is a map of every plot that people were farming around Dominanzi and Punkrum back in 2006. We mapped every single one of them. We mapped all the crops in every single one. I can tell you how many square meters of every single crop every farmer was growing. Yes, it was a little obsessive. Moving on. Um, what, all the plots you see that are colored in, that are of the same color, belong to the same farmer. So you can see they're disaggregated. Typical farmers farming four ish, three-ish plots. And when people come into this situation, especially agricultural people, uh, ag economists, they, they take a look at this and they quickly see something that looks terribly inefficient. And in some ways it is inefficient, right? I mean, you have to walk around and move around to get your farm. Those two red plots you see, those things are about a mile and a half apart walking. And it's not an easy walk either, having had to do that. 
um, it would be a real pain to have to deal with both of these on a daily basis, right? You're not going to be able to kind of monitor both your fields all the time. You're certainly not going to maximize your ability to use different kinds of farming equipment here because, I mean, look, you haven't packed it all together. You have to drive a tractor around. Not that anyone here has a tractor. Uh, no one's using tractors at all. But you just, I mean, in this particular case, it would be very difficult to do that. But this would be an incredible misreading of this landscape. Because what I can't show you on this particular satellite image is that actually this area is very, very hilly. And this disaggregation is managing for topography. What they're doing is putting plots on the tops of hills, the sides of hills, and the bottoms of hills to control for variation in rainfall year to year. The top of a hill will do great in a heavy rainfall year because you get plenty of drainage, but the bottom of a hill will drown, vice versa in a dry year. Sides of hills tend to do okay, except in uh, really, really heavy rainfall events where I've actually seen a farm wash down the side of a hill, but those are relatively unusual. So what you're looking at is effectively a hedge. What you're looking at is insurance that these folks have built in. For about 20% of their agricultural labor, they are guaranteeing that they will get something off their farms every year. And I have seen this operate under the most extreme circumstance it could. In 1998, the monsoon failed, and I was in these villages. It literally did not rain at all. Uh, well, we got like some tiny bits of precipitation that come off of the transpiration from the plants in the area, but really almost no rainfall. Nobody starved. Now, there were a couple days where there wasn't any food to be had in the village, but everyone managed to eat. Everyone met basic nutritional requirements. They limped through this season. Everyone was all right. It wasn't a good situation. I'm not going to tell you this is a happy place to be. No one had any income. A lot of kids couldn't go to school because back then they were still dealing with school fees. But no one starved. They didn't need food aid. They had managed this risk against the worst possible thing that could happen. You have to understand these systems if you're going to understand what you're looking at. And we're not just talking about complex agroecologies. We're talking about complex social systems as well. This, what you're looking at here, is one of my favorite charts ever. And that's such a dorky sentence. <laughs> the reason it's a, uh, you'll understand by the time I'm done why this is a fun chart for me. OK, so at the bottom, moving to your right, is the size of the farm. At the, on the left-hand side on the y-axis, going from the bottom to the top is how market-oriented a farm is. This really should start at one and not zero. At one, it's you eat everything on your farm. At five, you're selling every single thing on your farm. Now, this is for the households operating under one of the livelihood strategies uh, in these villages, a strategy where the husband produces everything for market sale and the wife is supposed to meet the subsistence needs of the household. That's how they break things up. So, if you look at the men and that curve for the men at the, plot, at the top there, totally unsurprising, right? No matter how large their farm is, they're pretty much oriented toward market sale. It's their role here. It goes up ever so slightly, which is exactly what the ag economists would predict. So that's nice. It fits the curve perfectly. But, but look at the women. Look how steep that curve is. There's a bunch of women who are clearly at the subsistence end of this thing. But you add a hectare, a tenth of a hectare or two. And a tenth of a hectare is 10 square meters. It's like, you know, size of this table, maybe a little bit, you know, actually size of this room. Take that back. Size of this room. To someone's farm. And all of a sudden, wham, they shoot up above the line. What's going on here? These women are making, are raising just enough crop that they're meeting the subsistence needs of the household, and there's a surplus. And under a con land tenure rules, women completely control the outputs of their farms, and men control the outputs of their own farms. So what's happening is the women, once they've met their requirement for the household, are taking the rest of the crop, going to town, selling it, leveraging up, buying a bunch of goods, coming back to the village, selling the stuff in the village, taking the profit, pay off the loan, leverage up again, go get some stuff, come back. And they do this over and over, ratcheting up their incomes till they nearly catch up to their husbands. Now, this causes an interesting social problem because you see, with the econ, women aren't supposed to make more money than their husbands. No matter how progressive an econ male you run into, you're going to hit a wall here when they start talking about this. I've had good friends of mine get into very convoluted explanations of how it is they make more money than their wives when it's patently not true. Um, because really for them, this is a challenge to gender roles. Men are supposed to take care of the household. They are supposed to be in charge of the household. And the way you do that is by earning a lot of money and making a lot more money than your wife so that you don't have to listen to her if she tells you she wants to do something else. Obviously, if she has a ton of money, she can kind of challenge that. At the same time, women who make a lot of money are not terribly trusted in these villages. They, they're looked upon as perhaps someone shirking their responsibility to the household. That gives them trouble among other women. They not, may not be respected or included in various social practices. And then on top of all of that, if women challenge sort of the status of their husbands as good men, 
Men are the route of access to land for the entire household. They go to their own families for this. So if some man is being challenged in terms of whether or not he's a good man, and he has to go to his household, I mean his, his family, to get land, they may not give him very much land, which effectively means the wife isn't going to get very much land either, so she's shooting herself in the foot here. We're dealing with an enormously complex dance in terms of trying to make sure you make a living, but at the same time fit things within social roles and not blow up the whole system. Also, one other thing here, part of the reason I love this chart. Don't let anyone ever tell you that peasant farmers don't have good information. A tenth of a hectare. To within a tenth of a hectare, eyeballing it, they know how much land their wives need to meet the subsistence need of the household and not make any profit. The women who jumped up, that was a slight miscalculation. The reason I know it's a slight miscalculation is I have longitudinal data. And guess what happened to the four women above the line the next year? Their farms got smaller. Jump, they drop right back down to subsistence. Husbands recalculated, fixed that problem. Also, sometimes uh, weather can vary and women do a little better on their farms than anyone expected. They just make an adjustment for that. So, we're dealing with tremendously complex social systems too. And when we're doing development work, we're not doing something in a really straightforward manner. I mean, think about what this means for gender roles and gender programming, right? I mean, how do you go into a situation and empower women when the entire livelihood structure is basically built on an enormously complex dance between gender roles? You could blow up the entire livelihood system here by doing gender work. It's quite a trade-off you have to think about. This then sort of gets to my last point here, which is that development, well, my last big point. I'm not done the talk, sorry. Um, <laughs> development and globalization really should be understood as catalyzing change in complex systems. We often think about development as sort of a we do A and B happens kind of thing. That's certainly how we program stuff in development. But that is not at all what happens in the real world. Really what happens is we do A with some sort of development intervention. B may or may not happen, but C, D, E, F, and G are happening because we're actually catalyzing something in very complex systems. The problem is in the practice of development, we're not measuring any of that. We're not looking at any of that. We have very narrow indicators because we said when we're going to do A, B will happen. For example, there's a water shortage in this particular place. How will we deal with that? We're going to put a borehole in. Then people will have more water. Put in borehole, more available water. We can measure that. That's fairly straightforward. But the problem is more available water probably has gender implications, probably has ecological implications. But if we don't have indicators for that, we're not measuring it. Therefore, we don't know what we're doing. We have no idea what sort of collateral impacts are out there. This is an enormously huge challenge for development practice right now. It's something people are wrestling with, but really we're not set up to deal with complexity at all. And for heaven's sake, don't start talking to people about overdetermination of causes because they get really upset and fetal. Uh, and that just doesn't end well in any given conversation. So, what this then gets me to is a real concern for how we do development in the world, right? Because I've been sitting in these two villages, I mean, I do work in other places, but these two villages are sort of the center of this book and the center of a lot of how I think about stuff. And what I'm seeing in these villages just doesn't align with the stories we've been telling ourselves, that we've told other people about how the world is supposed to work under development and under globalization. But this, of course, begs a very real question. Can we generalize from two villages in Ghana's central region? Well, on one hand, the short answer to this is no. I did not intend with this book to tell everyone how development and globalization really works. I had one reviewer who totally misunderstood what I was on about, despite flagging it repeatedly in the book. What are you going to do? Um, that is not what this is about, okay? These are just two villages. But there is a bit of generalization here. Because you see, if our assumptions about how the world works are wrong in a pretty average, unimportant kind of place, I was once asked that actually at the University of Ghana when I was giving a talk there. They said, what was special about this place that made you pick it? And I said, I picked it cause, precisely because it wasn't special, because it was pretty average as villages go. And if our assumptions are wrong in this average, unimportant kind of place, they are probably wrong in a lot of places. I can't prove that, but unless you are willing to gamble that I walked into the only two villages on earth where our assumptions don't hold, and I would suggest that's probably a bad gamble, we have a problem. This is a warning. What Domenazzi and Pongkrum tell us is a warning. The stuff we're looking at may not be the stuff we need to be looking at. That the way we are framing how stuff works in the world may not be the most productive way of doing this. So who cares? 
pretty important question, right? I mean, all right, so we don't know what the hell's going on in the world. <laughs> it's nothing new. There's all kinds of situations, right? The financial crisis demonstrated we had no idea what was going on in the world. Who cares in this particular case, right? <coughs> well, I think there are a couple of different reasons, a couple of different arenas in which we should care. The first of these is sort of a programming arena, okay? I'm going to get very practical. I sit part of the time at USAID these days, so I do sort of think very practically about how stuff gets done sometimes. And what I'm very concerned about is the way we are doing development and thinking about globalization right now, we're running the very real risk of totally misidentifying future challenges to human well-being, which is really what development's about, right? At the end of the day, we're trying to augment, improve human well-being in some way. And if we don't really know what those challenges are, then the stuff we're programming as development projects, et cetera, could be doing more damage than good. And that would be a disaster. And there's not a single person I know working in development who would find that an acceptable outcome. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's talk about the Gulf of Guinea for a second. We'll stay regional here. There's more or less the Gulf of Guinea. The water you see there is basically the Gulf of Guinea, uh, running from sort of the very, very western edge of Cote d'Ivoire down to the middle of Gabon. And all along there, you have what is called the Gulf of Guinea large marine ecosystem. It's a giant fishery. It's also undergoing a giant collapse, and it has been for more than a decade. It's a complex collapse being driven by a number of different factors that sort of intersect here. You've seen a huge population growth along the Gulf of Guinea, along the coast. So we've seen local fishermen picking up how much fishing they do to try to feed that population. So we have a local driver. We have massive illegal fishing going on with commercial trawlers that are really venturing into waters they shouldn't be in, but these countries lack the navies and coast guards to really effectively control their territorial waters, and as a result, we're seeing all sorts of illegal fishing, and it's EU, it's Chinese, it's all sorts of people in there that really shouldn't be. And the last bit that has been under-discussed, in my opinion, is actually climate change matters here. Because the fishery here is dominated by two big upwellings each year, one that runs from July to September, the other in December and January. When these upwellings come in, it brings the fish in close to where people can get to them. The timing of these upwellings is changing and their duration is changing. And people forget under climate change, it's not just the atmosphere. The atmosphere is intimately linked to the oceans. And so when we're changing the atmosphere, we're also changing ocean currents and ocean flows. And this is changing this fishery. So we got all three of these things coming together to really alter what's going on. And this is having big impacts because we're not seeing as much fish coming out locally. And these are, this is the main source of protein for most of the people living along this coast. So we're seeing a decline in protein intake along the for these populations, which is really not good for populations that are a little stressed nutritionally to start with. And we're seeing all kinds of efforts to manage this problem kicking in, some of them actually quite innovative. There's a whole program in the western region of Ghana right now looking at how we're going to govern this particular marine resource, which involves looking at traditional leadership, the state, scientific knowledge, local knowledge. How are you going to integrate all this stuff together? Because one of the things that we're seeing is the collapse of the fishery might create a tragedy of the commons problem where everyone sort of piles in and just fishes the thing out until it dies, how, and which in turn would collapse local uh, traditional authority because it's actually predicated on the control of this resource. How are you going to keep all this stuff together? It's a really interesting and innovative program, but it's also sort of completely coastal and governance oriented. Remember the toucan? We're back to the toucan. I told you we'd come back to the toucan. Before 2005, I'd never actually seen a toucan in these villages. Mm. I may or may not be true. I may have seen like one. I don't know. I don't remember the toucans, okay? But all of a sudden in 2005, there are toucans everywhere. And I mean, I didn't even know what a toucan was. It, by the way, toucan Sam, for those of you, not, not right. They actually are birds with like a hooked beak, not a giant beak. But in any case, and they don't have rainbows on them. Um, they're, they're, they're really not as attractive a bird as you would expect from toucan Sam. It's a little bit sad. But in any case, and they're not good eating either, so they're just disappointing all around. Um, what's going on here? is coupled to a bunch of other stuff. See, when the marine fisheries aren't giving you as much food, people start looking for replacements. And in 2005, for the first time, I saw people hunting. Before, people might have put a trap or a snare on their farm as they left at night, sort of opportunistically keep a pest off, and if they catch something great, you have some extra meat. For the first time, I saw people buying dogs and spending time during the day when they should have been farming, going around, hunting down every living thing on land. I mean all the way down, well into the rodents. Everything being wiped out. And guess what? Some of those rodents are the things that ate toucan eggs. All of a sudden, the natural predators for the toucans are being blown out 
we have piles of toucans. It's a canary in the coal mine or a toucan in the coastal plain or whatever your metaphor is in this particular case. Now, I don't know what toucans eat, but whatever toucans eat are not doing very well these days because there's a lot of toucans eating a lot of them. And whatever those things used to eat, that's probably exploding now. In other words, we have some sort of radiating onshore ecological change that no one's talking about or measuring. There's some big discussions about this, but I have not seen anyone gathering good information on this. So, we have this great coastal program that might talk about what's going on in the fishery, but we have a huge radiating onshore problem, which is completely decimating onshore ecology. That program doesn't even look at that. This is a tremendous problem when we think about programming and development, because we operate in all these stovepipes, right? Marine, terrestrial, fisheries, farms, all that kind of stuff with different money and different mandates. And guess what? Different monitoring and evaluation and reporting, which means that unless you're one of the people who happens to read all these reports, and there's no reason you would be in any of these agencies, you may not have any idea that all this stuff is linked up. This is an enormous programming challenge in development and one that we're going to have to start to wrestle with. And we are starting to think about it, but the only way we're going to wrestle with it is by actually coming back to those assumptions I was talking about and blowing most of them up and starting over. All right, who cares part two? Research question for everyone here. There's a ton of research questions in development that will never run out of research questions, I suspect. One of the things I'm deeply concerned about is that our assumptions about how the world works leads us to all kinds of conclusions that have led us to misidentify drivers of future environmental change. So if the first one is sort of a concern for what happens to people, poor people living in, you know, say, say West Africa, the second one is actually one that if you're just completely self-interested, you should still care about because environmental change tends to scale up at some point or other and get all of us. There are no walls high enough to keep the atmosphere out, right? So you have to pay attention to this. And if we don't understand what the future drivers of environmental change are going to be, we could be introducing or perpetuating deeply unsustainable behaviors with our development interventions. Let me give you another example of what I'm talking about. A lot of people living in sub-Saharan Africa make their living through subsistence agriculture, much like the people in Dominazi and Pankrum. And if you just spend about 10 seconds thinking about it, it's fairly obvious, right? Agriculture is land cover. And so, if people change what they're farming, they're changing land cover. And their people will change what they're farming for all kinds of reasons, be it market forces, new crop introduced, some sort of weather event, changing climate over time, whatever. When they do so and they change land cover, it changes biogeochemical cycles, right? It changes market prices. I mean, supply has changed. Demand will change. That, in turn, at some level, plays into a changing global environment, changing global economy, which of course can play right back into what kind of crops people select and all that. You can see all those arrows go both ways. This is just one big network. Now, the problem is that most of us who understand this very relationship tend to do what I do. We operate in like, you know, two villages. Where guess what? In two villages, it just doesn't matter globally what people do, right? And they can completely change their land cover, but the net release of greenhouse gas against the trillions of tons that come out every year from the planet, just irrelevant. Right? It just doesn't matter. But this is actually a fallacy of scale. See, the problem is that villages and individual farmers aren't islands. If people are changing their practices in one place, they are likely changing their practices in many places because they're likely being affected by the very same things that have led the people you're looking at to be changing their practices. Let me give you an example of what this might mean. One of the biggest problems we have is figuring out how much carbon is sequestered by different crops. There is stunningly little research done on this. It is boggling how little, actually. Really, all of it's been aimed at forests up to this point, and really we need to start thinking about much broader land covers. The big problem here, though, is that most of this carbon that is sequestered by crops is actually sequestered in soil carbon. And soil carbon is not totally determined by the crop. It's actually usually much more determined by agricultural practice as well as the quality of the soil which means it's incredibly locally specific. Okay, so we, you just can't make a global statement about how much carbon is being sequestered by a given crop. However, just to give you some sort of thinking about this, there is one good study I've seen in the West African savanna. It's in southern Senegal. And what they found on some test plots was that the average maize field sequestered about seven and a half tons more carbon per hectare than the average millet field. Now, there are giant error bars on this, by the way. It could be twice as much. It also could be substantially less. But that was the median that they found. Now, seven and a half tons. Who cares? Seven and a half tons is just irrelevant globally. It makes no difference at all. But if Senegal was to shift 
10% of its maize production into millet, a totally likely future scenario given changing rainfall and temperature that are pushing several strains of maize out of the range in which they can germinate and millet is much more resistant to those new situations and is already being grown in a lot of these areas. Just 10% of total production, it will result in a one-time release of 900,000 tons of carbon. That's not seven and a half. It's a million tons. Go next door to Mali, which is actually a substantially larger country, as you can see, than Senegal. That same shift is four million tons. That's a coal plant. Two countries, two relatively small countries, two crops. We raise dozens of crops globally, and we've got seven and change billion people on the planet. We haven't the faintest idea how much carbon is being sequestered or released by all the changes that we see going on, both changes that decisions being made indigenously by people in particular places or the stuff that might be brought on by our development interventions. We are flying blind. This is a tremendous challenge. We could be outweighing everything we do in clean energy just by shifting people into the wrong crops. We don't know. A giant research gap, something that we really need to fill here. Finally, a giant policy gap. I am deeply concerned that with the assumptions we are operating under right now, we are going to perpetuate the misidentification of the global poor as problems to be solved instead of sources for solutions to global, global problems we all face. Now, development's gotten a little better about participation and local knowledge in recent years. Uh, participation still runs a serious gamut that goes from like total local ownership all the way out to the right to agree to whatever I'm bringing to you, which is sort of the Millennium Villages model, but we can talk about that later. Um, but that's not a perfect situation. It, it's highly variable. It doesn't really totally work out. And what little credence we've been giving to local knowledge and has been growing in the literature and in practice is being seriously challenged by stuff we see going on in the world today. Between climate change and actually the most recent economic crisis has been interesting to watch because it actually shook up the development world too because we're seeing massive economic change happening in radiating global ways in ways that we've never seen before. The rate of change that we see globally in terms of environment, economy, the scope of change that we see is causing people to generate what I call crisis narratives where people start saying, it's all going wrong, everything's getting screwed up, we got to do something. Total panic sets in for some folks. And what the result of this can be is the dismissal, for example, of local knowledge. You know, you might think a farmer really knows a hell of a lot about what they're farming right in front of them. But if you think that all the environmental conditions that they're currently working under are not going to exist in a decade or two, it doesn't really matter what they know. At least that's the justification some people have. Therefore, forget what they know. We're going to have to bring them all kinds of new knowledge. We're seeing a reversion to this kind of attitude, which is something we haven't seen really since uh, the 60s which is sort of depressing in a lot of ways. What we're also seeing is the justification of all kinds of really extreme actions in the name of development, in the name of adjusting these sorts of things, such as let's turn northern Ghana into Iowa, which is really a suggestion that I heard from one of my colleagues. He was terrified by having heard that from someone else um, in, a, in a recent conference. You know, we'll just plow the whole place in, give them tractors, it'll be fine. They can just plant a bunch of wheat. Um, that's not going to work, but you know, it's the justification of these extreme actions because hey, whatever they're doing now, it's not going to be working in a couple of years. So we may as well just start doing whatever it is we need to do now. This is enormously dangerous because remember, as I showed you, what people are doing is not just aimed at maximizing incomes, right? It's already managing risk. And development and globalization, once again, they do serve as giant risk engines. People have to manage this sort of thing. And so when you blow out local knowledge, when you blow out what people are already doing, in the name of dealing with these challenges, you might be blowing out the one thing that actually works in this particular context to manage all these challenges. We're doing this because we assume people don't know. We assume how economies work. We assume how local knowledge works. We're mostly wrong, is actually my big argument. What we know about how people actually live in most of the global south is really, really thin. And that then takes me all the way around to the title of this talk, the title of the book. As some of you might have finally deduced by this point, uh, delivering development wasn't about bringing development to people, right? It was a cute double entente in the title. I meant delivering development in the sense of setting something free. And in this case, getting development away 
from the assumptions that have dominated it for so very long, from the things that we've done wrong for so very long. It's an enormously hubristic title, I know. Um, <laughs> That said, I didn't plan to do all of it myself. I'm trying to start some sort of a conversation about what it is development could be, what it is development maybe should be, given all of these things. And this then brings me around to just starting to talk about some of the solutions that I think might be out there. And this is not, by the way, the comprehensive part of the talk. Uh, when I got through this book, I was mostly still a critic who had never worked at USAID. Now the next book, we'll start to think more about how we actually put all this into practice. But let me back up from really specific sort of things that we might do to kind of get meta for a second and we can work out underneath that. The first thing is I think that everyone working in development, I would love to see in the sort of operating principles of every donor agency on this planet a sentence that says every day we work to put ourselves out of business. <coughs> think about what that means, right? That should be our goal. We should be getting rid of the problems that we are addressing through development and if we're not doing that, we're not doing our jobs. This tends to freak people out when I say it in development settings, but you know, this is really what we ought to be doing. Now, how might we do that? Assuming that people actually know something about how the world works in their, at least their local context, assuming that they have some means of not only managing all the risks that fall upon them, but some ideas about what might be done differently. One of the best possible things we could do is to stop telling people what to do and to start looking at the ways in which we can remove the challenges that people face every day that they spend so much time managing. That is something we can do without having to rework everything for everybody. Think about something like, say, index insurance. If you give people insurance indexed to the amount of rainfall in a particular year, and people can buy a small-scale insurance policy for their farm, maybe it costs them 5 to 10 percent of their annual income, which sounds like a lot until you remember that people are hedging away 20 percent of their agricultural production at a minimum on all these farms. And they don't have to worry anymore about controlling for rainfall. They can plant where they think things will maximize out the most. And if things go bad, they have an insurance policy that kicks in to cover them. You saw what happened for women's income when they had an extra tenth of a hectare of land. Imagine what a household does with 20 extra percent. We wouldn't have to do much else. Because you have to assume that people are not, they're not stupid. They're not going to squander 20 extra percent. They can do incredible things with 20 extra percent a year. That is a development intervention that might actually work and doesn't require us to tell people what to do. We would be empowering people with solutions to do the things they want to do but currently cannot do because they're too busy hedging and managing risk all the time. The one thing I would point out, though, is that in, we talk about managing risk. This is something that has to be done in partnership with folks. Because we, we sitting in this room, we sitting in this part of the world, are the generators of risk in many ways, right? We are the drivers of the global economy in many ways. We are the drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. This is stuff that we cause that we may better understand than the people living in these particular places. And therefore, linking what we know to what people know how to do in particular places becomes critical, I think, to managing this sort of risk. So then we get around to sort of the end of what I want to get to today. Development is changing very, very fast right now. I mean like whiplash speed in Washington. It's shifting away from the lending dominated world that it used to be. Uh, IDA, International Development Assistance, which is the lending to the poorest countries in the world, you have to drop below a certain per capita income to qualify for that, is disappearing very rapidly. Countries are graduating from IDA at a breakneck pace. Uh, Ghana graduates this year, which is really remarkable when you think about it. They will no longer be eligible for IDA assistance. Um, all sorts of countries. Uh, luckily, it's very likely in the next decade or so that pretty much all IDA will be aimed at Sub-Saharan Africa. Everyone else will be out. There will be a few countries here and there in other places. And not even all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Obviously, a bunch of countries will graduate. What this means is that development won't be about lending. Development is going to turn into being about technical assistance. And if you don't believe me, look at who the Obama administration just nominated to run the World Bank. For the first time, it is not a banker and it's not a politician, it's a technical expert. It's a very clear signal the administration wants the World Bank to be a technical assistance organization. They are going to move away from lending. Okay? This is a tremendous sea change in development. And as we move to technical sort of assistance, we have to avoid what Timothy Mitchell called sort of the rule of experts uh, impulse here, which is to say we, we have to be very careful to not revert to telling people what to do. We have to be very careful about how we get into uh, these kind of situations, what we bring into these situations. We have to start learning from the very people that we think we're here to help. 
That then leads me to sort of the last framing in this talk, which I think a lot of people have in the back of their minds when I say we have to start learning from the global poor, right? Which is, well, what can they teach us about a just and sustainable future? These are people struggling with low incomes, often living very reactive livelihoods, that sort of thing. My argument is, if we actually get on the ground and learn something about what they're doing, we can learn whatever we're brave enough to let them teach us. And I use brave very consciously here, because what I'm talking about is such a dramatic shift that it's not going to go very, very smoothly. We are going to have to accept mistakes we made in the past and we're making now, and learn from them. And most development agencies are not set up to learn from mistakes. They're set up to hide them. We are not really empowered to talk about failure. And one of the things I'm pushing inside aid is we have a couple people off on one side. I want them to bring in venture capitalists, and not the nice ones. I want the real sharks in the room. And I want them to stand up in front of our leadership and explain to our leadership that they have about a 10 to 20% success rate on their investments. But we're supposed to be 100%. Okay, we are not built to own our mistakes. We need to recognize that our assumptions don't line up with what happens in the world. And if you don't think that's going to be a difficult process, look at the attacks that Dr. Kim, the nominee to be the head of the World Bank, has been under for having the temerity in the late 1990s to write what we all know is empirically verifiable, which is that rapid economic growth often really negatively impacts the poorest people in a society. This is so verified and so standard knowledge, the World Bank altered its lending policies in the late 90s to address this, yet somehow he's being assaulted for having written it down. Our assumptions are very durable, and when you step outside of those, you're going to get pounded. It takes bravery to put up with that kind of thing. But in all of this, I still see an awful lot of hope. The world is full of 7 billion people, and we have not heard much from most of them. There's a lot of good ideas out there that we haven't heard about yet. I hope to spend the rest of my career listening to try to hear those ideas, and I hope that a number of you will be able to spend some time listening as well. Thanks. I don't like the term economic development. And the reason I don't is because I think it's incredibly narrow and it turns into people talking about economic growth really, really quickly. As if economic growth is the panacea that triggers all other good things in the world. And I think there's mounting evidence that that's not the case. Actually, Charles Kenny, who was here uh, relatively recently, if you look at Charles's book, and I've actually kind of poked Charles about this. He doesn't want to admit it because he's an economist, but it's true. If you look at his book, he's actually demonstrating that even though growth isn't happening in a lot of places, stuff's getting better for a lot of people in a lot of places. In other words, the quality of life does not appear to be very well linked to economic growth right now, which is an utterly horrifying thought for most economists, right? Because this runs fundamentally contrary to baseline assumptions they have about how stuff is supposed right, to go. So what's your definition of economic development or sustainable economic development? I don't, like I said, I don't actually like the term so I don't use economic development. I use development more generally and what I, in the most general way because I like to keep it really open, I tend to think about it as augmenting human well-being because I think that that is so locally specific and it, it also, okay, so there's two things. It's locally specific and the second problem is that there is this idea we have in the back of our heads, right, that through development we're going to create a whole bunch of little Americans everywhere in the world which live at our standard of living and all that. Well, let's leave aside the politics and all that, just talk about standards of living, right? They will all consume like us, they will all live like us, all that kind of stuff. That can't happen. There is not enough raw material on the planet to make that happen. We need about three and a half Earths to make that happen. Last I checked, we didn't have any in reserve. So that's never going to occur. So what does it mean then to develop when you're going to hit a ceiling at some point where it just isn't going to go any further. And that's why I talk about sort of improving well-being. In these villages, realistically, over a 20 to 30 year frame, I think what you could do is, for example, by removing risk, people would know where their food comes from. They would have safe and reliable shelter. They might be able to raise food in such a manner that they didn't have to dedicate huge amounts of time to agriculture. So their incomes may only come up a little bit, but maybe they're not working as hard for and it. That's exactly the indicators that USAID uses. <laughs> not reliably, we don't. Um, sometimes we do. Yeah, yeah, it, it's not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not the sort of thing we tend to look at. Um, but 
it would be something that would be worth considering. The problem is, of course, it gets very locally specific, and I will say in defense of some of the indicators, I suppose, you do want to be able to compare apples to apples and it, you know, to figure out if things are, if a program put here and a program put here, whether or not these things are working the same way. You want to learn if things are going differently in different places. Um, but yeah, totally changing up sort of how we think about this is kind of necessary, and it's not a place we're at right now. We're a long way from that, I think. Uh, I, the way you started, I, you started with uh, uh, two opposing viewpoints, uh, history mm -hmm. and uh, the science. The science. Yes. Would you mind, uh, you know, elaborating on those? Uh, sure. You know. Well, I mean, the, 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 so Billy Sterley mm -hmm. and Jeff Sachs sort of stand as totemic figures for sort of two different views of how development's supposed to work, right, for better or for worse. Although they both sort of assume those mantles, so I don't feel bad pinning them to it. Um, if I was to distill Jeff Sachs's attitude about development down, it really comes down to an incredibly technocratic view, right, which is that we can fix everything that's wrong in the world. We already have the technology, we already have the ways of doing this. And what it comes down to then is the reason we haven't is because we haven't spent enough money on it because we lack the political will to actually go out and do this in different places. And his argument also is that it's relatively cheap. Um, that is an enormously problematic thing. For me, I actually, even before I went into USAID, I hated that view because if we had known interventions that always worked, we would have used them by now. The only other alternative is to assume that this is some sort of giant master plan to hold the global poor in place, and that just isn't the case, okay? You have to start from the assumption that development agencies, and this I had in the book and I wrote the book before I got to aid, um, you have to start from the assumption that development agencies are populated by intelligent people with a hell of a lot of financial resource that actually want good things to happen in the world. So the more interesting question is why doesn't it work? as opposed to there's some giant plan trying to squash people. And Sachs kind of drifts into the, well, we lack political will, we could fix all this stuff. But he's just fundamentally incorrect about that. And there's just tons and tons of evidence to show that stuff that works in one place, technical interventions that work on certain issues in one place, are not necessarily portable to other places in the same kind of way. And actually, if you look at the performance of the Millennium Villages right now, Michael Clemens at the Center for Global Development um, has been documenting, and he has been getting savagely attacked in the media for this, by the way. Um, by Sachs, rather ad hominem stuff too. It's really ugly. Um, but Michael has been demonstrating, and now we have other independent evaluations coming in that show that the Millennium Villages aren't working, which some of us, like say myself, wrote about five or six years ago saying conceptually these weren't gonna work. They were set up exactly like modernization theory development back in the 60s, and that didn't work for exactly the same reasons it's failing now. And I could unpack that, but that's a whole lecture, so we're not gonna do that. Um, on the other side of things, then you have Bill Easterly, who is the anti sacks and those two really, I've, if you want anything amusing, follow both of them on Twitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although Easterly tends to poke at Sachs and Sachs tries to ignore him, which is, it, Sachs goes after Easterly but through proxies, it's really weird. Um, but in any case, uh, so Bill Easterly fundamentally disagrees with Sachs basically along the lines I just laid out. But for Bill, the argument of why, what would work and why things don't work and all of that, Bill argues really at the end of the day it's mostly about governance and that Governance, and governance thought broadly, by the way, we're not talking about just democracy or something. We're just talking about how you govern, how sort of societies are run, and how resources, development resources are employed, and how they're spent, and that sort of thing. His argument, which he can back up with some evidence, is that pouring money into countries, a la Sachs's suggestion, actually won't work out because most of these countries have what we call absorptive capacity problem. You can't just pour tons and tons of money in because they don't have the means of spending it productively. It's not set up to be spent productively. And if, you know, the example of this, what we could see this playing out is, for example, countries that find oil and suddenly all this revenue shows up. They're awash in revenue. Uh, Nigeria obviously couldn't manage it. Equatorial Guinea hasn't managed it, but that's because of their particular structure of government. And I'm watching Ghana very carefully right now, and they're having a lot of problems actually managing it, despite being quite well governed. Um, so Sachs's argument is it's not more money, it's not more resources, it's not lack of political will. That stuff's all irrelevant. We have to get the governance stuff right. My argument is that both of those arguments, at the end of the day, are predicated on a lot of the assumptions I was laying out in here, such as the, well, and predicated on the idea that economic growth fundamentally is what you need. Sack, I mean, Easterly's argument is that governance is what actually gets you economic growth, and economic growth is what gets you development. Uh, Sachs's argument is you just need to get everyone invested in a certain core areas, get a big push going, you get economic growth, you get development. 
Fundamentally, I, I think they're both wrong. I think that they're wrong in terms of targeting economic development. I think they're wrong in terms of how they think development and globalization work. Both of them are extremely ahistorical when they look at development and globalization, especially Sachs. It's as if nothing has come before. Sachs can't even um, grapple with uh, colonialism. He seems utterly unwilling to talk about how that set up the world. Um, whereas at least Easterly acknowledges it, at least in part because he lived in places like Ghana for quite some time, so he, he's seen it uh, on the ground. Um, I think that actually we need to step back one layer from the argument that they're having and actually much more fundamentally question the assumptions about how we think the world works before we dive back in to try to adjudicate that argument. Because actually I think that argument might be off to one side of the whole thing. They might be arguing about stuff and hey, they can argue about that all they want, but that may have absolutely nothing to do with what happens in two villages in Ghana because fundamentally they may be arguing about the wrong stuff. That's sort of how I view it. What, what happens to the agency of the people that are under either of those guys? Under, under sex. Sex, I don't see where there's any agency. Which is yeah, also that's another thing. That's my worry. That, uh, when we discuss development, we, we seem to just forget the people and Absolutely. take us as if we we're going to, you know. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, but that we are the ones who have to fix things, that people are the problem. We have to solve them, right? right? More or less. Historically, uh, it has been indigenous, historically. Whether you go back to ancient times, to the 21st century, it will still be the agency of the people that will actually run away. I, I absolutely agree with that. And actually, that's one thing that Easterly argues. Easterly does argue that we need to be relying on what people know how to do, but his feeling is that by getting governance right, that's what empowers people to do it. So he still thinks this is like a sort of a fundamental intervention that will trigger people to, you know, be able to innovate in these ways. But again, then it's economic growth leads to broader uh, good things for everybody. No, absolutely. I think there's a fundamental mindset in development, conscious or unconscious, that these folks are problems to be solved. It's not a universal view. There's certainly people who are really serious about local knowledge and learning from local knowledge. But there's an equal number of people who just don't have any sense that folks living in the global south have any knowledge that's worth anything. And then, like I was saying it toward the end, there's a whole set of people now switching camps who said, wow, you know, that's really important stuff that you know, but it's all irrelevant 20 years from now, so maybe I don't really care what you know anymore. I need to think about where you're going to be 20 years from now, and my technical knowledge is way more important than your local knowledge for getting there. So this is a bit of a wrestling match. Just as we started to make progress on actually recognizing what happens on the ground, there's ways in which this is being walked back. We should go here and then there. I just, we have a lot of um, undergraduates at Northwestern that they, they go abroad and they do international service learning. They work at community based approaches. They work with community based organizations that use participatory approaches. And I'm just wondering as the next kind of cohort of Northwestern students goes out this summer to work across the world, what concrete advice you would give them, things that you would encourage them to look for when they're working at a community level, and what types of questions they should be asking their host organizations. <laughs> So the first thing I would tell you, right, huh, this is funny actually, um, I would tell you to take nothing for granted at all. I wouldn't, this doesn't mean you should ignore people. I mean obviously if folks have been working in a place they know something about what's going on in a particular place, but I would take nothing for granted. I believe strongly in what I pitch to my graduate students is strategic stupidity, which is to say you may think you know what's going on, but it's probably worthwhile to forget that every once in a while. You may think you understand Sweden agriculture and how it's supposed to work, and the organization you're working with might tell you exactly how that works. It might be worth forgetting that and going and talking to a bunch of farmers and going, how do you farm? I did that a lot here, right? I, I mean, I had, it got to a point when actually after I got my PhD and became a professor, this turned into a problem, right? Because I could get away with being stupid when I was a grad student by just telling them I was a student and they would accept that. But then. I became a professor and they, 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 seriously, one day a farmer looked at me and said, shouldn't you be telling me what to do? And I stopped and I looked at him and I said, do I look like a farmer? And he looked at me for a second and went, no. And then we moved on because he recognized that I was still strategically dumb. And you learn an enormous amount if you actually just go and ask people. So I think that would be my first thing is as much contact as you can possibly have with the supposed beneficiaries of whatever you're doing and when you have that contact with them take nothing for granted. Ask them the questions that you might feel or dumb questions that you f might feel like you already know the answers to. You'd be surprised the number of times you'll get a really interesting answer. Oh and by the way do never ever 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 assume that by speaking to one person you have any idea what's happening in a village. You know what's happening with one person. 
because as it turned out in these villages, right? Remember, 110-ish adults? There are two different livelihood strategies in which men and women within each of those livelihood strategies see things rather differently. Then there are the female-headed households who see things completely differently from everyone else. And there are male-headed households, but those guys, that's a whole completely different story and they are incredibly transitory. Talking to any one of those groups, you get this tiny little partial picture of what's happening. Oh, and I should mention, by the way, all the households where the wife is pregnant, which is often, um, they operate under a completely different livelihood strategy, which is temporary, which they step into while she can't work and then step right back out of. So depending on when you walk in and talk to someone, who you talk to, all that kind of stuff, you're going to only get one little view. You need to talk to a bunch of people. You should try to find men. You should try to find women. You should try to find older people, younger people. Talk to everyone you possibly can. That is the best possible way to get an entry point. And likely what you're going to hear is something that really interests you at some point. That's your point of entry. Go through that. Start to explore that thing. It'll open up all kinds of different stuff. I mean, this whole thing, at the end of the day, I got totally tied into this because I really wanted to know why Pong Krum got abandoned. And don't, I mean, I'm sorry, Dominazzi got abandoned and Pong Krum did not. It made me crazy because I would ask people and they would be like, well, everyone left because there were no lorries. There was no transportation. And then I would say, and Pong Krum's right up there. And they'd all go, yeah. Which was not really an explanation, at least not one that I could cope with. And so, you know, it, it was the obsessive need, which is my own problem, to understand sort of why this road had altered so many things for some people but not for others, that opened up all this other stuff about livelihoods and then started opening up all this stuff about gender roles that I had to start writing about. And now at this point has opened up a total reframing of livelihoods approaches in development that I'm trying to get published because I actually think we're just wrong about how we're doing that too. So it's just an entry point that gets you to much wider things. So this is following up with your um, question about the institutions and it's not, not just kind of work. You know, a major more money is not the answer, there's more to it than just more money. And then you also mentioned how just because one technology works in one region doesn't mean it will work in another region. So what we, it seems that what we're looking at is research in the region yeah. that we want to create an impact in. Yes. But, and that is given that the countries that we're looking at don't have the capability in most cases to support that research. It sort of means, I mean, from an economic point of view, it's just an indirect reference to more, more money, right? Because, I mean, you're talking about all the students going to these countries and doing research, but they are getting funded through some source, maybe directly or indirectly. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess another way, to, another way to pose your question is, what do you recommend as like, because this whole problem of institutions is, you know, how do you go and talk to the people? How do you choose mm -hmm. their way? You know, they're, they're not a cultural, they're not a historic. Right. So is there any way you, you know, you, a good starting point to sort of address that issue? Yeah, I mean, no, this is, that's an excellent question. All right, so the first thing is, if you take nothing else away from this talk today, we really don't know much about what people are actually doing in the world. Okay? That's really the first thing you need to know. We think we do, but we're mostly wrong. And the thing is, it's actually interesting, do your other bellwethers, whenever the World Bank figures this out, you're, they're about 10 years behind most curves, so when they figure it out, um, and they would admit that to you, by the way. But um, so th you know, in one of their blogs, they have a couple of really interesting research blogs where they have really smart people. And one of the things they started calling social research, they're getting worried that it's, as they called it, weird, and they were using weird as an acronym. And the first two things are white, European, and then I forget the rest of it. But basically, all our assumptions about how people behave are drawn from histories of the United States and Europe, which might not be the best cultural frame, given we're not working in the United States or Europe. Um, so, so people, really, there's an enormous need for research, okay? So that's the first part. The second part, though, is who should be doing that research? I'm not convinced it should be people who look like me, actually. And so one of the things that I'm trying to set up right now is a, some sort of a program that actually is going to bring folks from West Africa to the United States, which has been done before. Aid used to do this, by the way. We used to actually pay for people's master's degrees and PhDs and then have them go back to their countries. We stopped doing this for some reason. And it turned out that that was an incredible capacity building success. And folks are talking about going back to this. Where, for a very specific project, because I'm actually working on something in Mali right now, where we would look at getting climate services and weather information out to farmers and how that does and doesn't work. It's a very complex process, actually. But bringing in six-ish people from West Africa who already work either in institutions such as universities or MET services or whatever the appropriate government institution is, bring them in, 
train them up to a PhD level, have them as they're doing the PhD work on some question that they think is really important in their country that needs to be answered, give them all this research support they need. They don't have to worry about writing grants, right? All they've got to do is figure out what's going on. We can pay for all of that. And they have to go back for a minimum of four to five years because what I don't want to do is fund people to come over here, get PhDs, and take tenure track jobs here because then there's no capacity building going on over there and have those folks go back and start building their own communities of practice, start training up their own people with whatever, there may be, so, there is money involved, but we're not talking about huge sums of money, right? We're not talking about millions and millions and millions of aid dollars anymore. I mean, okay, Northwestern's expensive, but like, you know, South Carolina, man, we're cheap. Uh, I can basically get you a grad student, you know, everything, including their research funds, summer salary, all this kind of stuff for like 50 grand a year, um, which is like tuition here. Um, you know, so, you know, I can get you everything for that. So I can get you like six students at a time for like $300,000 and anyone who's working development knows $300,000, most contract officers don't wake up for $300,000. Um, they won't even bother writing a mechanism out of aid for less than a million. So, you know, $300,000 is, is nothing. This is very small money, but the potential long-term impact of training up someone, getting them back and helping them to stand up, and by helping them, I mean tell me what you need to train your students or to train your colleagues or what resources you need to spin up greater capacity there. And we start standing up more of these kinds of programs. Because I actually think that most of this research should be done by people from these countries. And it's probably better done by people from these countries. Uh, you know, it takes time to figure out what's happening in a place that's not your home. I mean, 20 months of living in these villages, right? And I would argue that the first seven to eight, I was just a moron. I had absolutely no understanding of most of what was going on around me, and I was picking up pieces of it. And things start to glue together after a while, but that's a long, slow process, right? I mean, by the time I was done my dissertation, I'd spent 13 or 14 months, and I was reasonably conversant with what was happening, and I've still continued to learn things even going along. I'm sure that someone, and one of my colleagues at the University of Cape Coast is actually from one of the villages like eight kilometers from these. James probably could have skipped a whole bunch of the steps I had to take had he been empowered to take up that kind of a project. So if I have a vision for this research side of things and the generation of knowledge, I'm hoping it gets done by the people living in these countries. One other thought on that, not research, but data, right? We have giant data holes in the world. We just have no idea economically, in terms of the environment, in terms of all kinds of stuff, what's happening in particular places. There are opportunities with new information technology. It is not a solution for everything. I'm so sick of people thinking that the, the smartphone's gonna save the world or something. That's just not going to happen. But there are really cool groups. Uh, Frontlines SMS is one of them. There's some really interesting people out there who are thinking about how you can use things like text messages to get information and move information to people who, up until this point, we've largely ignored or paid no attention to. Cell phone penetration is unbelievable. I mean, in Ghana, it's absolutely incredible. 1997, there were no cell phones at all. By now, I mean, and you can get a cell phone signal in the villages I'm working in. And like in my house, in the villages we're working in, it used to be you had to climb a hill. Now they have like a tower nearby. They're everywhere, right? So there are ways in which we can empower people on these farms to report back what's going on if they see a benefit to information or resources coming back from the government or whatever. They can say, we're getting flooded here which may be information the government otherwise would never get. They can say, we're doing this kind of work. What else is, what are, we're planting this crop. What are other people planting? And try to figure that sort of thing out. Market coordination, environmental coordination. There's huge opportunities there. But in the end, it is about empowering the people who live in those places. It can't be all about what we do here. All right, well, I'm sad to say the time has come to close out the night, but let's thank everyone for time.